join me in singing our opening song, We Will Walk in the Light? We will walk in the light, the beautiful light. Come where the dewdrops of mercy shine bright. Shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, the light of the world. Thank you. Good morning. I've been out of this space for a little while. It's good to be back. I almost don't remember how we do crossroads. I think... It's my time to welcome you here. Uh, welcome to this space and to this time. It's, it's a good place to be and a good place to gather and a good thing to do and a good way to spend your time for the next, oh, 45 minutes or so on a Tuesday morning. A um, couple of announcements. Just remember our campus ministry organizations meeting this week. Uh, Blueprint tomorrow night. Andrew Hoots will be speaking. Um, he promises to bring a, an inspired message. And then Thursday night, as usual, FCA will be meeting. Um, if you're interested in those organizations, of course, you can ask us. You can find out more from us. So I invite you now to put aside whatever it is that you carried with you on the shoulders of your soul as you walked into this space. Lay it down, don't let it burden you, and become fully present. And join me in prayer. Holy God, we are grateful for this space and for this gathering. We are grateful for this time that we can set aside and focus on you and on our community and how we might come to more resemble Christ. Help us in this time to keep our eyes open, our ears open, our minds open. Help us to see the other people in this room as they are, children of God, made in your image. We thank you that we can do that. May this time be a blessing to those present. May it honor your name. Amen.
Luke 6, 27 through 38 says, Hear these words of Christ Jesus. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If, he, if anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap, for the measure you give will be the measure you get back. This is the word of the Lord. I keep doing this. I keep looking ahead when I'm planning crossroads for the semester and I keep choosing passages of scripture that I think are beautiful and challenging and that I'd really like to hear preached. <laughs> and somewhere in there I forget that I'm the preacher <laughs> and I'll be the one wrestling with the text. But you know, here we are. I almost titled this sermon, When Scripture Attacks because that's how I felt after I'd read it several times in a row. But then I thought maybe not everyone feels quite that strongly, so I dialed it down a notch to when scripture hurts. It's important to understand that while the person of Jesus was and is absolutely unique in all of human history, much of what he said and taught was not. He taught from the law and from the prophets, primarily reminding his listeners of what they were already supposed to know. Loving God and loving your neighbor, caring for the stranger in your midst, feeding the hungry, that's all Old Testament stuff. The golden rule, that, or some very close version of it, exists in every major world religion and in most of the ones you've never heard of. But what was unique, what was new, was this idea of loving your enemies, doing good to those who hate you, praying for those who abuse you. That's all Jesus. And it sounds awful, horrible, ridiculous, impossible. It sounds like we're being asked to be doormats, to just lie down and take whatever mistreatment comes our way. It does not sound like something a loving God would call us to do, not if we are really and truly loved, not if God really and truly wants us to experience joy. And this passage and others like it have been misused and misunderstood in so many ways. These words have been used to cause so much damage, keeping people in abusive, unhealthy homes, relationships, situations, keeping people in terrible situations because they are told that's what they're supposed to do to be good Christians. And it hurts. It hurts to think that this is what God might want for you. And because it's painful, we tend to do one of a few things. We push it aside and ignore it, favoring passages that feel better. Or we dilute its power by suggesting that this part of scripture is really not to be taken literally. Or we turn on ourselves 
and we berate ourselves for not being good Christians because we don't feel love toward people who have caused us harm, or we haven't stayed on good terms with someone who has hurt us. And so I say to you today, when scripture hurts, that's the time to dig deeper. Because if ever there was a passage that perfectly demonstrated the need for real biblical study and understanding of context, this is it. So first, let's talk about the longer passage in which we find these verses. Both Luke and Matthew record long sermons preached by Jesus. They share a lot in common, and Matthew's version is the one that we tend to be most familiar with, the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew records Jesus going to high ground, looking out over his followers and preaching the sermon. So picture like more auditorium, someone's up above, preaching down over the people listening. In Luke's lesser quoted, but very similar, Sermon on the Plain, we find Jesus on level ground, looking up at his followers, like over in Belk. This is not an inconsistency that you need to be worried about. In truth, he likely preached and taught these ideas in many different locations. They were the core messages, the gospel, if you will, that he was spreading as he traveled. But it's really important to note that both gospel writers, in both versions, and so likely, typically, whenever he preached a version of this sermon, he starts in the same way, with blessings. He tells his followers, first and foremost, that they are blessed. And this is absolutely critical for us to understand, because if we don't start there, we can't understand anything else he tells us. We call these blessings the Beatitudes. In Luke, the shorter version, he starts the sermon by saying, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. This message, this blessing, is absolutely revolutionary. He turns what they have been told are curses, poverty, mourning, into blessings. The things they have been told are shortcomings, things that separate them from God, and the sources of their deepest shame. For these and through these, they are blessed. They have been told they are unworthy. Jesus tells them that they are worthy and profoundly valuable. They have been told that they are less than. Jesus restores them to equality, to full humanity, to citizenship in God's kingdom, to membership in God's family. This must be read and understood first. The rest of his message flows from it, and if you skip it, you cannot understand the passage we've heard today. So now let us begin to see how Jesus is calling us not to be trampled on like a doormat, but to rise up to love as God loves. The actions he calls us to do not diminish us. They equalize us and allow us to respond with compassion and love. To get to this, you need more context. Luke says, if anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Matthew's version of the sermon adds one more. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Theologian Walter Wink calls these responses a third way. It is not allowing yourself to be abused, and it also isn't reacting violently. It is a powerful but nonviolent resistance. Because you see, in Jesus' time, 
as in our own, if you want to hit someone in a way that shames them, you backhand them across the face. But in that cultural context, you would only hit with your right hand. So Jesus says, if someone strikes your cheek, offer them the other also. If someone backhands you and you turn your cheek, you are allowing them to hit you again, but they can no longer backhand you. They must slap you with an open palm. This is what someone does when they're out of control. By turning your cheek, you are correcting their misunderstanding of who you are. You are not beneath them. They are not to belittle you with a backhand strike. You are their equal. And if they're going to hit you, they're going to have to do it as an equal or as someone weaker than you. You have refused to be dehumanized and you've neutralized their attempt to take your dignity. Similarly, someone could demand your coat as collateral if you were forced to take a loan. Wink says, only the poorest of the poor would have nothing but an outer garment to give as collateral. Demanding your coat would highlight your poverty and it was done to shame you for the condition you find yourself in. But Jesus says, if someone takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. In other words, if someone takes your outer garment, offer them all your clothes, saying, in essence, I'm so sorry you need my coat so badly. Here, if you are in such need, take everything I'm wearing. I may be poor, but I'll be okay naked. I'm not ashamed. Are you okay with my nakedness? Will you feel better if you've taken it all? I really want you to be okay. Again, this refuses shame and it exudes power. The third example that Matthew gives of walking the extra mile, Roman soldiers at the time could force civilians to carry their loads, but only for a mile. This was a law, a regulation that was meant to limit their abuse. Jesus says, if this request is made of you, offer to carry it an extra mile, because clearly they are weak. They are tired. You are strong and able, and they need your help. Instead of being shamed or allowing yourself to be treated as inferior, you are responding with compassion to a weaker person. And that is kind, and that is loving, and you are not ashamed. All of these responses turn the tables on the abusers. Abusers require you to feel inferior all of them refuse shame. W.C. Fields, who ranks pretty high on the list of people I never thought I would quote in a sermon, said, it ain't what they call you, it's what you answer to. If you have been called less than, you can respond as one with power and grace. If you have been shamed, you can respond as one blessed by God. And if you don't feel love for your enemy and that's your sticking point here, shouldn't you feel like a bad Christian for that? Nah. Jesus comes from a religious faith that puts practice first. Jesus is not telling us to feel warm, fuzzy feelings toward the people who hurt us. He's calling us to act in ways that are not harmful and in ways that do not continue the cycles of abuse and violence and in ways that might just possibly lead someone to transformative healing and changed behavior. If we end up feeling good about that, great, but that's not actually the goal. Love is an action, not a feeling. And what about forgiveness? That's a tricky one. Jesus calls us to forgive and to show mercy. And here again, we may have misunderstood this to be a call to accept abuse. And here again, it is anything but. Forgiveness releases us from old stories and old identities that were assigned to us without our permission. When someone hurts us, we cannot see beyond that hurt, and we keep getting stuck in the memory of what happened, feeling like we did in that moment. 
Forgiveness is what moves us past that hurt. We talk about forgiving debts. Imagine someone borrows $50 from you. They pay you back a little at a time, but they reach a point where it's clearly going to be difficult or even impossible to pay the rest. The debt consumes your relationship. They feel guilty about it. You feel frustrated or even angry. If you forgive that debt, you can both move on. You are no longer expecting the money. You have released that debt. And whether or not you stay in relationship with that person, you don't have to think about it anymore. And it's the same with emotional debt. When someone has hurt you, you wish for retribution. They must make up for it in some way. But there may be no way to make up for it. And in fact, you might be healthier not even being around them anymore. And so if you can release that debt and not expect a repayment, the consequences of their actions are left for them to handle. You are free. Joan Chittister says, forgiveness frees me from the burden of anger. What I refuse to forgive continues to harm me. It consumes my heart, poisons my mind, drains my energies, and cements my soul. The anger, the hurt, the bitterness we carry from the past does little or nothing to harm the one who harmed us. It harms only us. It is acid poured on our own souls, eating away at the peace in us. Forgiveness calls us to remember who we are and to whom we belong. We do not belong to the person who hurt us, and they do not have the right to hold power over us. It is not something that happens in the blink of an eye, but it is a road to freedom from past hurts. Becca Stevens, the priest who founded Thistle Farm, speaks of this when she tells her story of childhood sexual abuse. She says that she came to realize that the secret and shame of what happened to her weren't her secret or her shame. They were her abuser's secret, her abuser's shame. It was her story to tell or not as she wished. And so she was able to release herself from the grip of that trauma. It's the reason why I can stand here in this pulpit and I can tell you that I was assaulted in high school by a guy I kind of knew and thought was going to be a friend when I gave him a ride home from school. And I can remember how it felt, how powerless and vulnerable and ashamed I felt for a long time afterward. But I did come to understand that that shame and secret, they weren't mine. They weren't mine to hold, they were his. It's a story I wouldn't wish for myself or for anyone else, but it is part of my story, and I can tell it or not as I wish. It's the reason why I can stand here and tell you about the boss I had when I was 19 who invited me to what I thought was an office gathering, but was actually just the two of us. And he invited me in the slimiest way possible to come to his house to get drunk and watch movies and whatever. He was about twice my age. I felt, again, powerless and vulnerable, and even worse when I reported him and was told I must have misunderstood. That's not my shame. That's not my secret. That's his. For both of those people, with the healing brought by time and counseling and, yes, forgiveness, I wish good things, real good things. I hope they have had transformative experiences and that their broken places have been healed. I don't know if they have or haven't. I do know that I'm free. Understanding the context of this passage changes it from impossible imperative to a continuation of the blessing. It does not make us less than. Jesus says, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. To imagine this text as one that beats us down is to imagine Jesus as a liar. God does not call us to the impossible. God does perhaps call us to the unlikely, to the surprising, to the as yet unimagined, to the new. 
God calls us to take our places in a kingdom where the last come first, where the cursed are blessed, and where love is the law. This love that we are called to, it is not a love that we are shamed into giving. It is a love that we are empowered to give. In the holy name of God, we are empowered to forgive, to be merciful, and to give with grace because we are, in fact, agents of God's kingdom and heirs of God's promise, and we belong to no one else. We have been called blessed. We are acting on behalf of God. And in that, there is no shame. Amen. At this time, I would like to invite you to um, take about half a minute and reflect on what Stephanie has said this morning in her message, um, when scripture hurts. Think about those times that maybe you felt hurt by some other person. Maybe you need to give forgiveness to somebody. Maybe you're not ready to forgive yet, and that's okay. Um, but don't hold that shame on yourself. Um, and I'm sure it's okay, Stephanie, me telling this, but uh, uh, if you feel the need to, to reach out to somebody, to speak to somebody, Stephanie's available, I'm available. Our wellness center uh, with Cassie Bavone, our university, ch um, not chaplain, counselor, is also available. Um, but reach out to somebody if you're in need, if you need to speak to somebody. Um, but take a few minutes, or a few minutes, a few seconds, Think of something that you um, would like to write down on a prayer card, whether it's a, your personal prayer um, or if it's just one word, as always, um, that has, has held you without, or with this semester or through this year even, maybe the last couple of days. Think about that word. Write it on your prayer card. Um, will you sing with me um, now as we close this time of fellowship and worship? Christians, let us go and serve Him. Serve the One who gives us life. Let us love in love and power in the name of Jesus Christ. You are loved, and there's nothing you can do about it. You're dismissed. Thank you.